So you've got a chart that kind of leads into this. Um, it's the financial conditions remain uncomfortably loose, which is very different story than what I think we're hearing in the uh, kind of public narrative, right? Everyone's talking about quantitative tightening. They've uh, started to conduct that. They're raising interest rates. There's been tough talk since like November of last year uh, by the Federal Reserve. But this chart's telling a little bit of a different story. So explain kind of what this is, uh, what this is showing us and like why, why is the data showing us something different than maybe the public narrative? Yeah, no, 100%, man. So this this is a really important chart, and I want everyone to sort of take some uh, time to kind of understand this. The red line just shows the Goldman Sachs Financial Conditions Index. Uh, basically, how to, how to interpret the chart is when it's low, it means financial conditions are loose, or you know, very accommodative. And when the index is high, as a high value, that means financial conditions are very tight. We've seen a decent tightening off the lows in the red line, but if you look at it on a historical basis, I mean, we're basically about as loose as we were at the peak of the dot-com bubble. In terms of, you know, so if you think about this in terms of the Fed's inflation fighting uh, directive, they haven't really done anything to get growth to slow down enough to cause inflation to slow down, which tells you that, hey, as an investor here, we might have, you know, seen some pretty significant declines off the highs and, you know, crypto, Bitcoin, et cetera. Uh, but they could get a lot worse if the Fed is going to be successful in achieving its inflation objective. So when you start to think about this, there's this whole idea of quantitative tightening. And really over the last, I don't know, 13, 15 years, whatever you want to kind of count, there's been a very loose monetary policy. They at yep. one point did try to conduct quantitative tightening. It didn't yep. go so hot. They basically <laughs> waved the white flag very quickly and went back to loose yeah. monetary policy. Explain to people in, you know, kind of one or two sentences, like when you think of quantitative tightening, what should they be paying attention to? Or like, what are the important things to watch as they start to conduct this? Oh, well, I mean, number one, I mean, what's the level of volatility, both implied and realized in financial markets? Because what happens when the Fed does starts to shrink its balance sheet? We all understand that QE is positive for markets, but the reason it's positive for markets is mostly due to a substitution effect. We're taking safe securities out of the marketplace and leaving investors, uh, you know, whether they be asset managers, you know, retail investors, ultimately through mutual funds, et cetera, with a bunch of cash that's burning a hole in their pocket and that needs to go to work if they're trying to generate a, a legitimate return, a, you know, a real return. And so the content of tightening effectively works in reverse. The Fed is now creating a hole on the, on the, on the sort of the risk-free end of that spectrum. And now a lot of the money has to rush it from the, uh, the further out on the risk curve to capitalize the U.S. government. And it's just, you know, it's creating this sort of vacuum, this sucking effect on the, out, the further outs on the risk curve. So, um, you know, when you said quantitative tightening, they tried it and then they waved the white flag. You're absolutely right. And the scary part about this particular time around is that not only are they going to do quantitative tightening into a global growth slowdown, a U.S. growth slowdown, but more importantly, they're going to try to get to a double from the previous pace of quantitative tightening. We've never seen this before. We've never seen the Fed hiking interest rates 50 bips at a time, doing 50 to $100 billion of quantitative tightening at a time as they will be in a few months. And so I think it's a real, it's a science experiment to say the least. When you think of that, if they've never done this before at the speed, severity, you know, kind of simultaneous actions, the, the whole thing, should we throw out all historical analysis uh, because this is a new environment and something that we haven't seen before? Or do you think history can still serve as a great guide uh, as we evaluate what could happen in the future? Yeah, no, 100 percent. You don't want to throw out historical analysis and analogs. But what you do want to understand is that everything financial markets operate from a rate of change perspective and particularly a rate of change relative to expectations. And so, you know, when you look at the world through that sort of, you know, that, 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 that very quantitative lens, rate of change, what's happening at the margin, what's changing at the margins, you then can bring in the historical analogs that help you uh, identify, hey, you know, the Fed might be shrinking its balance sheet with bigger numbers now, but on a relative basis to what the balance sheet was, this is, you know, it's called a one sigma move uh, lower or two sigma move lower. And so you can normalize things and help you create more scientific and more thoughtful analogs using historical data. And the reality is when you're talking about the kind of growth slowdown that our models are projecting, at the same time you have a quantitative tightening episode, you know, you're talking about anything on the order of 20 to 30% annualized declines in the S&P, 40 to 50% annualized declines in high beta stocks, and 60% and annualized declines uh, in something like Bitcoin. Um, this is a really negative macro environment from a flows perspective. Um, so all bets are off if you think about, uh, you know, trying to buy the dip here, which a lot of investors have done. 